Celiac disease is an autoimmune condition triggered by dietary gluten, which are proteins that are found in grains like wheat. It's very different to a gluten intolerance though. This is where small amounts of wheat-based products don't cause long-term damage, but sometimes dysfunction and discomfort. In contrast, gluten in someone with celiac disease can cause local inflammation in the small intestine, systemic manifestations, and increases your likelihood of cancers like lymphoma. Its pathophysiology revolves around an immune response to gluten peptides. When you eat gluten, it gets broken down into smaller proteins like gliadin. Once in the lumen of the bowel, gliadin passes through the bowel wall. These peptides then get modified by tissue transglutaminase, making deaminated gliadin. This then gets picked up by an antigen-presenting cell. Thinking this could potentially be something kind of nasty, the APCs present the gliadin on its serving platter, like HLA-DQ2 or 8, to a naive T-cell. This activates the T-cell and primes it for an immune response. The most recognized etiological or causative factor is having a gene for HLA-DQ2 or DQ8. However, other environmental factors, like exposure to gluten or certain viruses, may also play a role in triggering the disease. Its clinical features include bad dermatitis. B stands for bloating. Long-standing feelings of abdominal distension should really make you think about screening for celiacs as it's often missed in childhood. A stands for abdominal pain. This is often a crampy discomfort felt after ingestion of gluten. D stands for diarrhea, which is often chronic or intermittent. Dermatitis refers to dermatitis hepatiformis. This is a rash over the extensor surfaces of the arms and legs, trunks or bum, which is intensely pyritic. These papulovesicular lesions are pathognomonic of the disease. To investigate celiac disease, you should start off with serology testing. Keep in mind though, that this can only be done when a person is currently eating a sufficient amount of gluten in their diet equivalent to four slices of bread. There are three tests. There's anti-tissue transglutaminase, anti-deaminated gliadin antibodies, and total IgA. This last test is used to exclude celiac disease associated IgA deficiency, which can cause false negative antibody tests. If the serology is positive, arrange an endoscopic biopsy of the duodenal mucosa. A diagnosis is confirmed by blunting of the duodenal villi. Gene testing is not an appropriate screening test unless someone is on a gluten-free diet and is unwilling to have exposure to it for a month. A positive HLA-DQ2 or DQ8 is not diagnostic, but it can exclude the disease if it's negative. Management of a newly diagnosed celiac disease involves three broad steps. First, you should really treat any deficiencies. Micronutrient depletion, including iron, B12, folate, vitamin D, are common. These should be replaced, and adults should be screened for osteopenia by measuring their bone density. Second, you can screen for other diseases and watch out for some complications. Test thyroid function, as celiac disease is associated with autoimmune thyroid diseases. And pancreatic complications are something just to be aware of. Finally, you should encourage a patient to start a completely gluten-free diet. You really need to make sure a patient knows that ingestion of even a small amount of gluten causes tissue damage in the small bowel. Gluten should be avoided in celiac disease regardless of the presence or absence of symptoms. Let's recap with some mnemonics. To remember its management, think of the three R's. Replace, review, and remove. Replace micronutrients, review and screen for other autoimmune diseases, and remove all gluten. 
And don't forget that bad dermatitis features should always prompt celiac screening. Thanks for watching Townsend Teaching.